everybody. Uh, so my talk is called Service Worker and the Appification of the Web. I had an alternate talk title that was Service Worker and Web Appiness, but I kind of thought for a Francophone audience, maybe Appiness, Happiness, it's too ambiguous. So <laughs> I didn't try it out. So there's been a lot of excited discussion over the past year or so about Service Worker. You might have heard some breathless commentary about how Service Worker represents a revolution of the web platform, how it changes everything. So if nothing else, if we know nothing else about Service Worker, we can conclude that it's quite hot, it's uh, very hyped, and it definitely moves the web forward, right? That's one thing it, it, it does for sure. But what I want to do in this talk is I want to start off by kind of dissecting that phrase, move the web forward. Because we hear this repeated all the time, right? Let's move the web forward. We're moving the web forward. But it's not exactly clear what that means, right? Like, what direction is the web moving in? Why does it need to move at all? And why is service worker such an important part of that process? Well, I believe that to understand which direction the web is, is going in, it's useful to look at history. It's useful to look at where the web came from. So let's flash back to 2004 which was around the time that HTML5 first got started, which was one of the first real efforts to really uh, move the web forward. And uh, what was the context of the time? Well, at the time, IE6 was the most popular browser with around 80% market share, and it was the latest version of IE. So that was kind of the state of the art for the web back then. That was kind of the best you could hope for when you were building a website. Uh, <laughs> obviously, a very different web from the one we have today, uh, much less feature-rich web, but that's what we had. And within this context, uh, some motivated folks from Mozilla and Opera put forward the first position paper on what would later become HTML5. And what, what was motivating them? Well, they explain in this paper, they say that in 2004, there was a rising threat of single vendor solutions. OK, well, that's interesting. So what are they talking about? What were these uh, rising threats of single vendor solutions? Well, this is explained in another article from 2004 by Chris Kaminsky of the web platform project, or excuse me, the Web Standards Project, um, where he lays out these rising threats as uh, Sun with Java, remember Java applets, uh, Macromedia Flash, later Adobe Flash, uh, Mozilla had their own uh, thing even called Zool, which was kind of an alternative to HTML for building rich interfaces, and then Microsoft had Silverlight, which was kind of in its infancy, it was known at the time as Project Avalon. And what these all had in common was that these were all kind of rushing in to fill a void. In Kaminsky's words, they were... Uh, rushing in to stake their turf in the emerging rich app market. Because at the time, the web wasn't really such a good platform for rich apps. Right? Um, the W3C, which is the organization that defines the standards that define the web, wasn't really interested in web applications. It was interested in things like Semantic Web, XHTML2. Um, and so there was this vacuum left over, and all these vendors kind of rushed in with their proprietary solutions to this problem. And at the time, these proprietary solutions, these proprietary platforms, uh, Flash and Silverlight in particular, posed a real threat to the web. Um, these were vendor-specific platforms. They weren't based on open standards. And they were kind of, they were on the web, but not really of the web, right? They sort of fed off of the web. And they were a serious threat to the web because in many ways, honestly, they were just better. Like, if you wanted to build a really good experience for your users, if you were a developer and you wanted to build a really rich interface with lots of animations and interactions and maybe some audio and some video, Flash was a really compelling alternative to the web. And Silverlight was a compelling alternative, too. So you can't really blame developers for choosing to eschew the open web and build for these proprietary platforms, because for the experiences they were trying to build, it was just a better tool for the job. So in this light, HTML5 can be seen for what it was. It was a response to the challenges, the existential challenges posed to the web by Flash, Silverlight, and similar platforms. And ultimately, this competitive environment was good for the web. This is where we got a lot of the great features of HTML5, things like file upload, video, audio, uh, copy-paste, canvas, animations. All these came about because the web looked at the context around it, and it borrowed bits and pieces from Flash and Silverlight and similar platforms and incorporated them into the web platform. And it's worth noting that this wasn't just a copy-paste job. This wasn't just a matter of taking the, the Flash APIs, taking the ActionScript APIs, and just copying them verbatim into the web platform and calling that a standard. There was hard work here to make sure that the vendors could agree on these implementations, they were, or these APIs, that they were standardized, that they didn't sacrifice the web's existing privacy, security, and performance model. But the important point is that the web didn't just stand still when it was getting outcompeted. It rose to the occasion. 
It looked at the context around itself, and it adapted and evolved to ensure that it could remain relevant for the next generation of users, the next generation of developers. And by all measures, it worked. HTML5 was a, was a success. Uh, Flash and Silverlight are slowly getting phased out. Java applets are a distant memory. If you want to build a rich interface for your users, whether it's an email client, a video sharing site, a 3D game, you can do it today all with open web technologies. And that is a huge victory for the web. But it's worth remembering that we didn't just get here automatically. The web doesn't just win because the web always wins. Uh, it doesn't win through uh, historical inevitability or divine birthright. No, it wins because people who work on the web fight to make sure that it remains relevant, even as the context around it changes. I mean, we could have very easily ended up in a future that kind of looked like this, right? Like, the web would be kind of segregated along proprietary lines. You go to a website, it would say, best viewed with Flash. And then another website would say, designed for Silverlight, Java support coming soon. Right? And you laugh at this, but in truth, this isn't so far from our present reality. Because even though we don't have best viewed with Flash, best viewed with Silverlight, what we have today is this. Download it on the App Store. Get it from Google Play. Windows Phone support coming soon. Because as it turned out, the web only really won on desktop. We beat Flash and Silverlight just in time for mobile to take over the world. So those same experiences that today on desktop are largely consumed via web browsers, things like social media, email clients, uh, news readers. You go to mobile and it's the exact opposite. They're all consumed via native apps. And once again, you can't really blame developers for abandoning the open web and building for these platforms, because for the experiences they're trying to build, these platforms just offer something that the web doesn't. So once again, as in the Flash and Silverlight era, people are just voting with their feet against the web. So as Bruce Lawson, formerly of Opera, says, uh, there is a new existential threat. It's not Flash and Silverlight this time. It's native apps, which are feeding off of the web and arguably killing the web. But there's good news, because this is where progressive web apps come in. So in the same way that HTML5 can be thought of as a response to the challenges posed to the web by Flash and Silverlight, Progressive web apps are the web's answer to native mobile app platforms. And just like HTML5, it's not so much a single monolithic technology as it is a loose collection of technologies, the most important of which are Service Worker and App Manifest. Uh, I'm not going to talk about App Manifest for this talk because I don't have time. I'm only going to talk about Service Worker. But to understand where Service Worker fits in here, it's good to ask the question, what are native apps so good at in the first place? What are they doing so well that people are willing to build for these proprietary platforms, often at great cost to themselves, right? Because you have to build the app once in Java, and you've got to build it again in Objective-C or Swift, and then build it again in C-sharp, and then build it again for the web if you want a web version. Like, people are going to a lot of effort for this. They must be getting something really good out of these platforms. Um, and they are getting lots of good things out of this. But some important things uh, are offline support. Uh, push notifications, uh, offline support really good uh, for ensuring that your experience remains good even when you're like, in a tunnel, uh, on an airplane. Uh, push notifications, really great for user engagement, bringing people back to your experience even when they're not currently in your site or your app. And then background sync. Uh, isn't it so nice when you pick up a native app and you haven't even used it in a few days, and yet it has the freshest data, it has the freshest tweets, the freshest emails, because it synced that all in the background. And as it turns out, Service Worker covers all three of these bases. So Service Worker, essentially, is a client-side proxy that stands between your site and your server. So it can do things such as intercept fetch, fetch requests. So it can intercept a request for HTML, CSS, JavaScript, images. Uh, it takes that URL and can respond with whatever it wants. So you can respond with a response from the cache, from the network. And this allows for very, very flexible offline scenarios. Uh, push events. You can send push notifications to your users even when the site is not currently open. Um, and this actually isn't just useful for push notifications. You can also use this for pushing data. You can push data from the server to the client using this technique. And then background sync. Uh, this is useful for pushing data from the client to the server. So it might take the form of something as simple as the user has gone from an offline state to an online state, and you want to push data from the client to the server. Or there's also an emerging spec called periodic sync where you'd be able to do this on a kind of periodic basis, say, once every 30 minutes. And it's worth underlining that, as with Flash and Silverlight, this is not just a copy-paste job. This is not just a case of taking exactly what Android and iOS are doing and just shoving that into the web platform. Um, you know, on native platforms, you can have background services that do very heavy operations and chew through the user's battery. And uh, we would not want every single website that you stumble across to have those same capabilities. So there are some important limitations to Service Worker. First off, it's only available on HTTPS. We have to make sure that users aren't going to get man-in-the-middle attacked. 
Uh, we have to make sure that they know who they're dealing with when a service worker gets installed. Second off, service workers are ephemeral. This is kind of a subtle point, but service workers aren't so much a persistent background process where you can do lots of heavy lifting and you have a lot of control over it, so much as they're kind of fire and forget. Like they receive an event, you know, a fetch event or a sync event or a push event, and they're supposed to quickly respond, respond in a timely manner. And the browser is actually free to terminate uh, a misbehaved service worker whenever it wants to, and it will frequently terminate service workers and restart them uh, as it sees fit. And then if you do want to send push notifications from your service worker, you need permission from the user, and that permission can be revoked at any time. OK, so I work on the Microsoft Edge team. What are we doing uh, in the service worker space? Well, most importantly, uh, we are implementing it. Uh, that's kind of important. That's like a good first step. Uh, Chrome and Firefox, thanks. <laughs> Uh, Chrome and Firefox have already shipped their implementation. We are working on ours as I speak. It is set to ship very, very soon in an upcoming release of Edge. And I want to give you a little peek behind the scenes of how we're planning to implement our version. So we're implementing service workers as a persistent Windows background process, which might seem like a weird technical detail, but it's actually really cool. Because what it allows us to do is it allows us to actually launch the browser, take someone to your site, even when the browser is not currently open. So for instance, you send a push notification, uh, the user sees it in their notification tray, they tap on it, and even if Edge is not currently open, we'll just open up the browser and take them to uh, wherever you want them to go. Um, list of recent mails, list of recent messages. Um, we're also working on this implementation where we can spawn multiple service workers at the same time in parallel. And uh, this is still getting hammered out, but essentially, uh, this is just another good reason for you to think of the service worker as being ephemeral like not really fire and forget, or, or not really a persistent background process, more fire and forget. Don't rely on global in-memory state inside of your service worker, because there might be more than one at once. So I've talked a lot in this talk about how we at browser vendors are working to push the web forward. But what I have to acknowledge is that there has been some pushback from the web community. So there's this interesting post from PPK called Stop Pushing the Web Forward, where he says, pushing the web forward currently means cramming in more copies of native functionality at breakneck speed. Interesting stuff, mind you, but there's just too much of it. Now, I think this concern is coming from a good place, and I actually think this is a really good discussion for us to be having in the web community. But I also think that PPK's fears are unfounded. And the reason for that is this. The web has never been a static target. The web has always been changing to match the context around it. Uh, in a sense, like, the way I like to think of the web is that the web is kind of like David Bowie. <laughs> like, like, yes, Bowie changed dramatically from decade to decade. And yes, he borrowed heavily from the context around himself. He was kind of a chameleon, right? But there's still this consistent thread of Bowie-ness that kind of runs through his whole career, right? In the same way, the web was constantly changing, constantly evolving to match the context around itself. But there's still a consistent thread of webbiness that runs through each decade. Um, and in the same way that when Bowie borrowed something, whether it was glam rock or crot rock, uh, even if he didn't invent it, you know, arguably he did it best. And this is another strength, I think, of the web. Even if the web doesn't invent everything, often it does it best. So I want to end this talk with some thoughts about what you as web developers can do to help us keep the web webby, keep this thread of webbiness alive as the web changes. And I'd like to kind of start this thought process by asking ourselves, what makes the web great in the first place? Why is the web worth defending versus other platforms? Um, there's a great blog post by Ada Rose Edwards. Shout out to Ada, who's going to be on next. Uh, she says, the web is not fashionable. And the point here is that the web is not great because it has the latest and greatest features, because it's the most cutting edge platform. Often, it's not the most cutting edge platform. It's not even great because it has the greatest developer experience. Often, it doesn't. Um, no, what makes the web great is that the web is the freest platform. The web is the one platform that is not owned by any one person, any one organization, any one company. The web belongs to everyone. In the words of Anna von Kusturen, the web is a public good. So this is a mural that we have in the Microsoft Edge office called The Web Works for Everyone. And I walk past this every day on my way to work. And I think about this a lot because I really love the way that this kind of captures this vision of the web as being this kind of chaotic, uh, diverse place with lots of different people uh, using lots of different browsers, lots of different devices, but all enjoying this one shared common experience together. Because the web isn't about just one vendor. It's not just about one browser. The web is about building something for everyone. So my challenge to you today is to go out there as you're building websites and to embrace web pluralism. 
Make sure that you're testing in multiple browsers. Make sure you're not making the web about just one vendor, just one browser. Even if you're using one particular browser primarily for development, you know, give the other ones a spin for a week or two. Um, make sure that you're testing in lots of different browsers, testing lots of different devices as well. Uh, make sure that you're building websites that don't just run great on your 16-core MacBook Pro, <laughs> running the latest and greatest of everything. Right? Because I promise you, if you can make your websites look great on like, really poor hardware, it'll run even better on the latest and greatest. And use techniques like progressive enhancement. Service workers are a great example of this. You can build a website that works just fine without service workers, but then when you add service workers in, it's just a bonus. And this is actually great for us browser vendors because this gives us the signal that we need to go out and implement this thing. This gives us the encouragement we need to implement these APIs. So if you want browser vendors to implement these APIs, you have to use them. Um, and quick shout out, if you are not on Windows and you need a way to test Edge and IE, uh, you can download free virtual machines at edge.ms. I'm amazed how many people don't know about this, so I, I always mention it in my slides. Uh, totally free, takes like a few minutes to set up, super, super simple, so it's really easy to test Edge and IE. So this to me is the true definition of moving the web forward, is that, yes, we at browser vendors, we will work really hard to give you developers those features that you are clamoring for, those features from proprietary platforms, as we did in the past with Flash and Silverlight, and we are now doing with native app platforms. We will work very, very hard to bring you those features that you desperately want. And all that we ask in return is that you help us maintain the things that make the web great, that you help us keep the web open and pluralistic and a web that truly works for everyone. Thank you.